Andrew G. Farina is an assistant professor at the U.S. Military Academy, Department of Behavioral Sciences and Leadership. He has 10 combat deployments, serving with both conventional and special operations units. His research interests include leadership, character development, and risk-taking propensity. Let's welcome our next speaker. Thank you. Take just a second to get set up. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, <clears throat> a little bit different than, than the other uh, speakers in this session, but I think you're going to hear a lot of the same things, which is creating a reproducible pipeline, right? Something that we can, we can look at, we can measure, we can make sure that everything is, is reproducible both from a time perspective, that as packages change, as things change, um, it'll continue to be reproducible, but also something that as you change something early in the cycle, later in the cycle can also catch up as well. So a way to do that, I'm going to take you through my own personal journey and all of my own failures um, working on my, my PhD over the last few years. Um, my field, developmental science, you know, isn't necessarily the most um, numbers-based or exciting, exciting to use numbers. I, however, am much more of a numbers guy. So when I walked into my first class and heard about SPSS, I just kind of like sunk, right? So um, as I geared up for this, my, my wife, who's also a PhD uh, or who's a research scientist, encouraged me to learn a new language. So I spent about a month, or I'm sorry, spent, spent a summer before my PhD really digging into to R and the R ecosystem. And I thought I, I finally, I solved it, absolutely solved it. The key to reproducible research is just R scripts. Right? As long as you write it down, it'll never change. Everything's good. Um, and it works really, really well. And I thought that was true. Right? What, I, what, what it ended up happening, though, is R scripts really became more of like a gateway drug. That's also how I describe R. Once you learn R, then you kind of want to learn HTML and CSS and, and LaTeX and, and continue on as you go. But that's really the way, the way it happens. So, um, you know, R scripts are great. You know, tidyverse, I absolutely love the tidyverse. I love R markdown. I love all the things that they do. But the key that you look at when I think through this normal um, kind of tidyverse workflow are all the, the packages that go into that. And those packages change and things break and there's dependencies that break and there's all sorts of stuff that go into it. So I struggled after I started doing this over the course of a couple years as I started running earlier analyses to then catch up to my, my um, dissertation, I noticed I had to re rewrite some of the code, and it was really, really frustrating, right? So then I started investing a little bit more or, or digging a little bit more into the Renv package, um, which, which basically takes a snapshot of the current state of the packages that you or the current state of the, the package that you have, and then it, it basically holds everything to that um, state. So even if you update it within R, when you open up the project that you're in, it reverts back to the previous one that you had used. So you know that it's going to work uh, for the most part. Lately, I've really, really been intrigued, and I'll show you why uh, based on my dissertation, I've really been intrigued by the targets package, which is a, which is a very R-specific, kind of like a makefile, um, but it's a little bit more within the R language that allows you to both visualize but also to keep things updated as you go. Okay. I thought, <clears throat> why just have slides, right? Why not do some live coding? Because that always works uh, in front of audiences, especially in front of audiences uh, who are super intelligent. So um, wish me luck, right? Very dangerous, yeah. Uh, so just to really, really briefly go through the, the Renv package, um, and, and I apologize, I'm not sure how familiar people are with um, R and R Studio in the in the audience. So I'll, maybe I'll take a step back for a second. Within R Studio, which which is a way to interact with R, run R, you have the option of having different projects. The projects themselves are are s sort of like localized containers. Although that's not a good word since we just heard about Docker. Um, but it's a way for everything to resort back to that that location. So you can use packages like the here package um, and use uh, relative locations within the project as opposed to trying to use absolute locations on your machine. So as long as people 
have a similar project, they can open up a project and I can open up the data file in there. They're not going to try to set the working directory to, you know, C colon user, my last name, whatever. So that helps from a project perspective. It also helps allow, allow you to have some, some options for within the project. One of those is REN for our environment is what it's short for. When you set up the, the package itself, it's just literally calling uh, initialize function, INIT. When you do that, it takes a snapshot of all of the packages that are currently being used in your project, and it stores that as a location. Um, I've updated one of the packages or a couple of the packages to show you what this would look like um, if there's a change. But right now within this project, I have a REN file. There's a lock file that talks about um, actually, let me pull it up so you can see it. Um, that'll show you all of the project or all of the packages and and the version that they're on, where they came from, and these are all the dependencies within this very simple project that I created, which is absolutely ridiculous, right? Um, so you can see how quickly things could break if you're not careful. Okay, so once I'm done, let's say everything's been running great. It still seems to work well. I want to update a few of the packages. Um, I can just call uh, snapshot to take a snapshot of uh, what I currently have. It's probably going to tell me that a couple of them need to be updated, which is not a surprise. Target types, targets, and, and sharing in uh, moved up one, one minor level. So I'm comfortable with that. I want to proceed. Go ahead and add those into the new lock file. So now they'll use the latest version that I want to use. If I, if I was doing something and it turns out that it didn't work well, I can go back and I can restore from a previous version. So it makes, it makes the, the minor packages a lot easier to use, which is exciting. But what I really want to talk about um, during this, and thankfully I have plenty of time to do that, is this targets uh, framework. So uh, Will Landau, who I've never met, uh, but I've watched a ton of his videos, came out with this targets framework way of, of working through R, and it really resonated with me, and here's why. So here's my project for my dissertation. And what you'll notice, hopefully you can see all of that, these are all the files that I have open, right, that are part of my dissertation. This is just one paper, um, admittedly the longest one I've ever written, but it really wasn't that long. I have different chapters. I have different things that are hard-coded in here. So I've done all the things that I've been told to do for reproducibility, and it's been great. I have a REN file. I have this. But what I struggled with is the order in which I do these. So if I change the data, which inevitably seems to happen, I find that there's an outlier, there's a missing um, data point, or there's something corrupt in the data that I need to make an adjustment, I have to remember to go back and say, okay, what relied on that data set? Where do I update it? Where do I go? And as I built out this dissertation with different chapters, um, hard-coded things in there, um, Gregory, as you said, storing things in um, like a cache state, if I didn't remember to update that cache state, I, not everything got updated as it went, right? And it became a, super, a, a really big problem for me. So I started looking more into this, and this is why the targets package became really interesting. Um, in preparation for this talk, I opened this dissertation back up uh, and tried to remember what the flow was. Right at, at some point, I knew it. I don't remember it anymore. And I, I tried. Um, at some point, I'll have to. I'll have to do it. But for now, no. Um, so the targets framework. If you think about it as what it does, it establishes certain objects as targets. And it allows you to see those, and it and it can tell if those targets themselves have been updated. So what I have here is a very simple script. This is a, a normal um, targets workflow in that you establish as a list the specific targets that you want. So the way, the way I'll read this so, you, so it's maybe understand is somewhere in this project, there's a, there's a folder called data, and in there there's something called car underscore price. It's a CSV file. I form, I've set the format to just be file. I don't want you to, to recreate it. It's just a file. I, that's all I want. And it's going to create a target called raw data file. And that's it. And that's just something I want you to check on. If that updates, I want to know that it updates. And that's it. My second target, um, what I want to do is I'll, I'll call a function. I'm just going to e import that raw data file. That's all I want to do. I'm going to call that my raw data. 
My next target, I made a function called clean data, right? Or preprocess is probably a better word to say that. Um, so it's going to preprocess the target called raw underscore data, and it's going to save that as a target called data, right? So all I'm doing is setting a sequential uh, workflow, and then I want to run that through a model. So the clean, clean underscore data um, is just in my functions folder. It's a very simple thing. All I did was change the fuel type to be a factor and uh, take the price and divide by a thousand. So we didn't have a, uh, we weren't looking at dollars, but by thousands instead. And for the model, for the um, linear model, literally just a, just an LM function. That's all it is. Very simple. Um, and it went through each of the data points. So now what I can do, now that I have the targets thing, I can visualize where, where I am with this. So um, biz, I'll run this network. And what it'll show me is a network of the targets that I have. So what you can see is there's something called raw data file, which I talked about. There's a function called clean data. There's a function called model. Let me see if I can scroll in just a little bit for you. Maybe not. Um, and those all lead into, I'm sorry, the raw data file and the clean data lead into raw data, which then produces data. You can click on each of these nodes. And ultimately, the linear model is contingent on all of these things working, right? OK, great. Everything looks good, sounds good. I'm going to build this out a little bit more so you can see. Um, I'm going to add in uh, a second model, which uses it's just using a tidy models framework for linear models, so they should be relatively similar. I'm going to also have it uh, render a report. I want our markdown to be rendered in there, and then it's also going to re-render my slides uh, for this talk. So all of these things are in here, um, and I can update. Once I save that, I can run the same thing, the Viz network, and you'll see those those nodes that are now added in. In particular, you can see it's a little bit hard to see, uh, to see maybe, but um, at the far right side, those are my slides. That's dependent on the markdown output. The markdown output is dependent on the linear model and the tidy model. Then those, of course, are dependent on the data. What's nice about this is if I want to run everything that's in here and I want to set it up, all I have to do is tar underscore make. And it will run all of these things, all of these processes, and it will build it, and it will give me a time. Now, it took 2.3 seconds, right? Fairly easy. None of this was too bad. But if you had a very computationally intensive model, what this does is it only uh, recreates the things that are out of date. So if only the linear model was out of date and not the tidy model, it wouldn't have to recreate that. It just knows that it's, it's there, so you don't have to worry about it, OK? So now that I've created this, we can, of course, just mess around with it a little bit. Let's say um, in the cleaning function, uh, let's mess with something fun here. Oh, in the markdown. Let's do that. So this is just run everything. Um, and in the background, it actually also rendered the R markdown. Um, and I can show you what that looks like. Here, so it's just a simple HTML. The model output is at the top, the, using the tidy models framework. Very similar linear model output. Obviously, the tidy models, I only use the training data. So it's a subset of the data. Um, so the numbers are slightly off, but relatively consistent. And then I looked at, um, just quickly, whether or not I could predict the actual price of the cars. No surprise, the cars that are um, more expensive are just a little bit harder to predict. There's some other value. There are other things that are important besides just horsepower, gas, uh, mileage, that kind of stuff. Okay. So let's say I wanted to change that um, report, though, just a little bit. I just don't like the way it is. I want to add in some sort of description. And this, of course, could be anything, right? I'm just going to save it is all I'm going to do. And now if I go back and I rerun this visual network, we're going to see it runs. It actually shows that the report is now out of date. 
So it shows what's still up to date and it shows what's no longer up to date, right? And of course, everything depending on that report is also out of date. So this way I can see and be like, oh, okay, I, yeah, I, gotta, I definitely need to fix that. So I'll run tar make again. And what it's going to do is it's going to skip everything that's already. <laughs> yeah, good. Of course it's going to do that, right? That's okay. Because we have this framework and it's just going to work. I'm confident. One second. Okay, so you can see it skipped the raw data, it skipped the linear model, the tidy model, and it just built the report, and then it built the slides after that. So it took 1.9 seconds this time. It seemed to work out, okay? If we change something in, let's say, the cleaning function, so instead of, um, we just won't divide by, we'll just keep it in dollars instead. just want to show you this one more time so you can see... look at this visual network again, hopefully. And we can see now because the cleaning data script is out of date, it threw off the data, which threw off the linear model, the, the, the um, tidy model, the report, and the output as well. Okay, so now we can rerun uh, target make, and it should put everything else back up together. Okay, so again, it's, run, it's rendered everything in, in the background. I don't have to worry about redoing the report. If I go back to... Um, my HTML file, you'll see it was slightly changed, um, well, quite a bit changed because we moved from uh, thousands of dollars to, to single dollars, right, for here, so. Um, I believe that is all I have. Just interested in your thoughts, um, something certainly to explore. This is something that it can be used in um, both uh, distributed computing and I believe also in Docker containers as well. Hi, uh, Matthew Avery. I'm from Ida. Thank you for this presentation. This was really interesting. Uh, I'm interested in how scalable the targets package is. Like in your experience, how complex a uh, system can you build with that? Because, um, for example, projects like the one Benjamin described where you have many, many, many inputs and many, many intermediate steps uh, is that something that targets can scale with very easily, or are there sort of upper limits on the complexity? Thanks. Yeah, that's a great question. So <clears throat> I don't know would be, would be the best answer that I could give. However, um, there is a limit to what targets is able to do, and he, here's why I think that. I'm sure there's ways to set it up um, so that it, it isn't, doesn't do this, but right now um, – what it does is it creates these targets, these things called targets, in this targets folder. So these are all the objects we just called in. And you can see these are relatively small, um, but I would imagine as things get more and more complex, you're, you're adding more and more um, requirements for that there. So I, I think there probably is a limit. Um, and certainly the visual network would get really hard to see, I think, over time. But I'm not sure. Any, any other questions? All right, so I'll point out we got done a little bit early, and all three speakers are still here if you wanted to come up and chat with them. And I'd like to thank all three of them. I've used all this software for years, and I, I keep learning stuff all the time. I've been, I've been using ours since my hair was brown. So <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. I should probably try that. So let's thank all our speakers.